Hi everyone. Got people signing on. Good morning. Hope you're all doing well. Had a nice weekend. It's a bit of a holiday weekend, although I gather everyone's very busy, so maybe you didn't feel like it was a holiday. Um, at least in Canada, there was uh, some days of celebration for Canada Day. A bit muted this year for very good reasons. Um, boy, here now. So um, we got chats, we got people. Oh, I'm saying hello. Excellent. Um, all right. So I was on um, Pats a bit this morning um, answering some questions that got left behind for a bit. There's still some there. Sorry about that. I think uh, the TAs took a bit of break as well. Although I know actually one of our TAs is having the same problem. Um, a bunch of students are having is that she's about to travel or she's in the middle of traveling. Um, Fatima is, I think, supposed to be flying today or yesterday on her way here to Canada. Um, and I know lots of you. Uh, oh, she went back home. Um, have flights coming soon, so there was a thread talking about that, um, asking about um, moving the um, assignment due date because currently you've got assignment to do uh, next Sunday and then a test right after that week. Um, so I just replied to that like I'm okay to, to move them back a bit, give everybody a bit more room, but I've got to figure out how to fit everything together. So um, maybe I'll put some polls up on um, Piazza later today and figure out what would work better for people. Um, because we're supposed to have a test next week and then a test in the final week of classes. So one option is just to have one test at the final week of classes. Um, it'd be worth more, but it would give us big reviewing everything, basically from the algorithms part of classification forward. Um, and then the assignment still due in the exam period, the final assignment. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll have some polls and ask people a bit. Yeah, if you guys have ideas here for the people who are, are here, it's great to chat about it. You're only a third, you're about a third of the class, so <laughs> your opinion can sway more since you're coming and, and chatting with me. Um, but I would put a poll as well to ask for some things that might work. Yeah, I mean, a possibility would be having just two tests, and so the final test kind of covers all of the remaining topics. Um, or we have three tests, move test two a little week further, and then have the final test maybe in the exam period, but it'd be kind of smaller than an exam. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back and look through other questions in the chat, because we have a bunch. Um, I was asking um, Milad to do something with the data output for Kaggle to explain how you can form your data, and we didn't do that yet, so sorry. Um, we are trying to do it soon. Um, Right, so a bunch of people actually prefer having three smaller tests. Okay, but I'll do I'll do a poll and um, and figure that out. I just I had a question there in the chat and people can can reply on that. Um, that I just asked also like schedule wise, would people be okay having the final test in the exam period? So there's a bit more space. Um, that's just another option. It could be kept to the same schedule. But if we kind of move things so that next week everything's delayed a bit, then it just means the last two weeks are going to be quite crowded with stuff. Um, okay, yeah, so somebody's asking about test two and um, additional topics of um, the other dimensionality reduction feature extraction methods like multidimensional scaling, LLE, and ICA. Um, when I said they're additional topics, I just kind of mean, yeah, they're like higher level understanding of them. Um, 
So you should know what all of those different methods um, kind of are used for and good for um, in comparison to each other. Um, but the three core ones that we listed, you might want to know a bit more of the technical way of the, the way they they work. Um, so uh, so you could answer questions on on that. So um, somebody was asking just about um, what are the features and labels that are used for LDA training. It's the same as the data. So you're using all of the actual features of the data set you have. Um, and the label is one of the three labels we gave you, right? So um, there's three separate labels for different types of outcomes in this data set. So you can think of it almost as three data sets. There's the data set with all of the features and the confirmed label, the data set with all the same features and the deaths label, and all those features and the recovered label. It's just that they're all in one file, but these are three separate kind of labels, right? Um, and so we're doing binary classification on each of them. Um, and so whenever you're training models on things, you're going to have it set up to process the data. You're just going to switch which label you're training it on and doing results on. Um, yeah, and so that applies for PCA, LDA, but also for the algorithms like decision trees or random forests. Um, you're going to be doing classification on one of these labels at a time, and then you can just use the same code for the other ones. You get a, like, a loop that goes over all three and saves the data and plots the three results. Cool. Yeah, so you can actually do yeah, a bit of analysis of the PCA components and LDA components and see how they relate and which ones you want to include and use those as, your, as part of your new data. Oh no, you should do pre-processing. So um, Huda Tib's got um, a question about uh, using all the features. Right, so part one we're saying you got to do some pre-processing, you got to normalize some of the, the features. Um, some of the, the date fields are in kind of weird different number formats, so you got to kind of make them work. Um, right, and so it's saying you're going to use uh, the original data set and the hybrid data set um, for some of the algorithms. But when you're using just the original data set, it can be, um, sorry, I did mean yeah, the original data set, but after pre-processing and normalization. Right, so the, um, the third assignment, um, I thought they'd been up there. Yeah, they're on the, um, they were always on the website. I think some of them weren't on Learn, so I did update that just this morning when I saw it. Um, but last assignments do um, after, like in the exam period, so right now. Um, August 10th is when they had it set. Um, so it'd be in the middle of the exam period. That's why for this course I wasn't going to have an exam in the exam period. I'd stop it in the last, that last few days of classes instead of, you know, new things. Um, there's test three, and then uh, the assignments due um, after that. Oh, sorry. That was the original idea. And it sounds like people here at least want to stick to that for the the tests and, and structure, they just want to move things a bit back. Um, yeah, um, for yeah, for the state itself, you've got a number, or you've got a state ID and a state string. So I mean, the state string, the name of it is not very useful. So you probably could just remove that. Um, you have state ID as a number, I think. Use my data set has. Um, so you wouldn't have to do any hot encoding. Oh, you, um, right, but it's a it's a number, so. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, having it as, as one hot encoding, I guess, um, would be a way to do it. Um, I don't think that's, that number will actually be very useful um, because it's uh, very specific to a specific state in its pattern. So it's just going to be like, well, was it going up before? Is it going to go down now? Like it won't be able to tell you about changes um, in direction um, based on the state, right? So. Um, if I were doing it, I'd drop the state idea entirely and try to learn something that's more general on all the other um, features. I didn't say that, did I? Yeah. 
I would think these are not really the super useful um, features for you. All the other ones are telling you stuff about the state in more general would be useful. Okay, so we have actual content questions. We've got done index. We've got neural net questions. I'm just writing these down so I can call up slides. So Sharmi's question about performing LDA and PCA, PCA, PCS, uh, mistype, uh, for three given labels individually. Yeah, that's right. Census features, do they? Density. Well, I mean, yeah, all these census things are highly correlated with the states, right? Because they don't change across your data set. The population of California is the population of California. So in a sense, those are also unique. And the state ID itself is going to be pretty redundant, right? Um, whereas these things will change day to day for each state, but be related to those numbers. So. So it's good to think about what is the uh, yeah, usefulness of a different feature. And this is why your analysis can see it, right? When you do your um, PCA um, and trying to see um, ranking, well, it won't tell you for the features, but if you, um, I guess we had the pair plot before, right? If you do correlations amongst features and try to see what's, um, what's useful, you should probably find that these state and state IDs are perfectly correlated, right, with these census data. Um, so they kind of don't add any additional information. Like I said, there's each of these population census numbers almost seems like it could be an ID for the state because none of them have the exact same population. Um, so if you think of it that way, what gives you additional information, it, it won't be useful, right? Um, whereas lat long, you know, this is the location of the state and you can say, well, those are unique as well. It's the center point of each state um, and it's unique. So why would we need that? Because the center of California is always the center of California. Um, but your model could actually learn things that, you know, states that are west of a certain line have a certain pattern or south of a certain line have a certain pattern. Um, and that's actually quite plausible in America because they do have regional divisions that could explain some of the data. So these ones you could argue that long, you know, really could be useful somehow. Um, Yeah, sudden increases, like sudden spikes that are numerical. Yeah, I don't know. It's a broader question. If you look at, especially if you're looking at individual, since we've um, boiled it down to like, has the number increased or decreased from the previous day, we're kind of smoothing over this this problem that um, Sufian's raising. Like some states, if you go and look at them, like Colorado, I remember Colorado or um, Idaho, one of these states at one point had this huge spike um, and it was because there was like a rally, like a motorcycle rally of people who were anti-mask or something a year ago. And literally lots of people showed up. And then literally two weeks later, a lot of people got COVID. And so like, oh, there's a real explanation for this, but it's not the normal behavior. And then sometimes there's a spike because of data issues, like they missed some records and then they found them and they added them to that day rather than the previous days. Um, so those are just challenging things in this kind of data in general. Um, if you knew it was a logistical issue like with data you could move the data points and shift them out um, and if it's a historical thing like everybody showed up that day or it was a holiday you could try to integrate into your model like maybe add another feature that explains you know uh, what do they call them critical events um, super spreader events you know and if there was a super spreader event then you know you would expect the numbers to start going up two weeks later um, 
but you'd want observations of super spreader events and holidays and things. Um, you don't need to worry about that here, but it is interesting to think about. Um, since we're only looking at one month and they're binary, I don't think it's as big an issue for this data set. Yeah, the labels are very unbalanced, as somebody's, uh, as you're asking there, uh, in your data set for the assignment, right? Um, because at least on one of them, they're super imbalanced, right? That um, almost all the labels are on one side. Um, Right, yeah, recovered is like almost all one value, um, and confirmed is almost is pretty good, so it's not as bad. Um, but yeah, you can definitely use methods to um, to deal with unbalanced data, right? You could do oversampling, like resampling of data with certain labels to try to give you more examples of them to to move your model in that direction. Um, use all the tools that are your available availability to to. Make improvements. Um, and the criteria for building a hybrid data. So we talked about it earlier in, in the, the session. Um, it's not that strict. So I'm trying to get you to explore different ways of um, extracting features and using them creatively to try to improve your analysis. So um, my suggestion is getting um, PCA features and adding them, a few of them, to your, your existing features, um, and maybe an LDA feature from one of them. Although, as somebody points out, then you're actually training on the labels, so you're actually um, going to be overfitting a little bit. Um, but PCA wouldn't have that problem because it's unsupervised. But uh, you can do it different ways. All I asked was that to do something, essentially, for um, those two algorithms, the random forest and gradient tree boosting. Um, you got to basically do some kind of um, hybrid where you add additional features in some way or replace them. Um, sorry, I had my mute on. Um, so I yeah, found my slides. Somebody was asking about, you can hear me, right? Um, the Dunn index, which I don't really have a lot to add uh, directly. Um, I just know it's 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 one that gets suggested for use um, for uh, clustering data sets because it c combines together a bunch of things that are meant to be um, are often useful for determining clustering because in true clustering. Right, we've got an unsupervised um, situation um, where we do not know, right, um, whether um, the data points are in the same uh, class or not. But we're trying to find patterns that are useful. And um, if it was labeled, if we had a label of the true clusters, then we could do supervised on it, right? We might have a small set of manually labeled things, but not on all the data. But it's truly a clustering problem, then we don't know the labels, right? We're just saying we want groups that are meaningful. Um, and so we have to define what meaning, what separation and meaningful clusters are, right? And so it's kind of subjective, but you could think of ones that are useful, right? And so these rules we talk about that the cluster should be denser than the, um, the surrounding areas. Um, and they should be separated a bit. So if you can see clouds of points that are a little bit denser and have gaps between them, we want to label those as clusters, right? Um, and so we have these different notations for doing that, um, different um, measures for kind of evaluating that. Um, these are these internal measures that let us say, well, let's, let's talk about separation between them and density inside, and you could just define those in different ways, right? So it's what's the, the distance between, what's the density of a region by computing the distances between a bunch of different points and then looking for um, these separations uh, where where a gap is so big that it must be like an external gap, right? And we had this max link and single link and complete link where you're saying, you're looking at the closest distance or the nearest distance of the two points in your proposed clusters. Um, but you can come up with any other measures that kind of do a similar thing. There's really only so many ways to do it. Um, 
So the done index, let me reformat that a bit and go down. I'm trying to remind myself what it has. It combines all of these into one measure, right? Um, and D. Okay, we're going point. No, it's cluster distance, right? Distance between clusters and then distance between points. So distance between points, you know, we understand what that could be, and it's Euclidean distance usually, but it actually could be something else. You might use a Manhattan distance or some other um, distance, depending on it. If you're doing distance around, you know, the Earth's surface, you would want to use like a geodesic distance that tells you how far apart they are in a straight line, right, flying. Um, but then the distance between clusters, they're using this minimum one, which I guess would be a com um, complete link. Although, yeah, it's still open to to flexibility. So it's still a done index, even if you swap um, some of these. Maybe not. In general, you could do these for, for different methods, but for the done index, they're minimizing that. So you want the distance between the points in the cluster to be as small as possible, so a nice, dense, compact cluster um, between every pair of clusters. And then diameter, so like that completely thing where you're saying what's the furthest distance between two points in a single cluster, that's the diameter of the cluster, and you're trying to have a ratio, right, where you're saying that um, the ratio between the distance between clusters, the nearest points, and the width of the clusters themselves, the diameter of the cluster, is um, minimized. And the i and j here are the two different clusters where so this is really just two different loops, and we want to say, um, put them in, put points into clusters such that this measure is minimized, right? And you're going over all possible combinations of clusters. So with a ratio of nearest distance between clusters divided by the maximum diameter, right? So you want them to have a smaller separation as possible, but um, a large diameter, right? And so the diameter being bigger would make this number smaller. Um, the distance being bigger would make it bigger. So you actually want a small gap and very wide clusters. So kind of not very dense, but the most aggressive kind of dividing line between clusters that you want, right? because you're going to be minimizing this distance and maximizing the width. So it's kind of a very aggressive um, index. If you're using this to maximize, you're trying to say, you know, is there really even just like a slightly less dense area between these clouds of points um, where I could say that they are now in different classes and that clusters, and that's what I'm going to use, right? Rather than looking for these very distinct changes in density. Um, but it's not the only measure out there, it's just this one, if you, that's what you're looking for then. Um, speaking of neural networks, somebody asked a question about that. So Richard Schwang had a question about threshold function. So in neural networks, your threshold function for your activation function, yeah, the differential or the function if the differential of the function is zero, is the gradient, how could you use it for gradient descent? For the ReLU function, if the input is less than zero, you will have the same problem how to solve that. Okay, so we will go to activation functions. Yeah, we've got slides here. Okay, so activation functions. Right? If you haven't um, gone through that yet, you should. Um, differentiable. So I guess, Sushan, you were asking if the differential of the function is zero. I'm not sure what you mean by that. You mean the gradient or the derivative? 
Um, right, so we've got um, our neural network, which is composed of a bunch of, in the simplest case, logistic functions, um, where, well, logistic functions, which have a certain shape and, and input parameter. Um, but we've combined them together in a number of layers. In this version here, just it could be just the three layers of the basic neural network, or um, artificial neural network, as some people will call them. Um, and you've got your activation weights, and you're getting an output value, which gives you some uh, value, a numeric value that you're going to use to um, do classification or just as your regression prediction. But all the weights are what you're training, and all the axes are the data that are coming in. Um, and there's multiple layers of these weights. Um, the activation functions happen um, at every step. Uh, where um, we basically take the output of the weights, the, the data and the weights from the previous layer, and funnel them through some nonlinear function, which is called an activation function, right? And this is an essential part of it, because if you didn't have that, you'd just be having linear logistic regression with lots of variables, and you wouldn't necessarily find an answer, because it would have to get into these contradictions, and it might just maximize a particular value. But once you add a nonlinear relationship, um, you're basically pushing a lot of values away um, from, into the extremes, right? And so the default one that got used for a long time was a sigmoid, right? And I had a very non-smooth uh, thing there. I could just hide all my notes. Hide notes. Um, that basically means very low values um, would give you minus one, and then some of them would be scaled and the high values, whatever the value was, would give you a one, right? Um, so this question is talking about, let me see if you can answer. Okay, was about um, these outputs. So basically, I mean, it doesn't matter if the output you get is zero. It seems like both the questions are about um, what happens if you get a zero? Because um, what you're doing is you're trying to follow uh, the gradient. Really, is about how much change occurs, right? So, for the gradient, I guess we can have another. Um, um, for every um, change in one of the weights. Um, how much does it change the uh, output of the um, the resulting function, right? So if here is your, um, sorry, if here is your entire um, representation of uh, the neural network, um, each of the Fs is like your activation function that's kind of putting it through some nonlinear structure. The question is for the, the gradient, um, if I increase one of these weights by a very small amount, or an infinitesimal amount, if you're really doing calculus, but just some small concrete amount in the computer, um, would the final output go up or down, right? If it goes up, then the gradient for that, the gradient of the entire function with respect to that particular weight, so let's say we're doing weight, you know, five, seven, right? It's the weight of the fifth layer and the seventh node down in the fifth layer. The weight of 57 um, going up causes this activation, the final um, output, to go up, then the gradient should be positive. It goes down when this weight goes up, then the gradient should be negative, right? It's basically, are they correlated or anti-correlated? And then the actual value of the gradient is some kind of scale, right? So how much does it go up by? How much influence does this weight, this weight have on the final output? They're all gonna be quite small, but the more important weights for the particular data point you had um, would have a larger gradient, right? So you can compute the gradient and have it be all mathematically kind of correct based on this function, or you can have any function that has those properties, as long as it is kind of scaled in proportion to the impact of the weight and its output on the, the final answer, and it's got the direction correct, right? There's a lot of methods to try to remove noise and uh, random like scat, like um, exploration. Um, so rather than using um, 
rather than using some precise like gradient like formula, the actual derivative of your whole network, you would just use the sign, say, just make it plus one and minus one and make it so that you know whether you should go up or down. And then you have a standard step size for going up or down. Um, or you could have a baseline that says, you know, the variation is kind of constrained. Um, so it's not necessarily that it has to be this perfect derivative. But then your question was about um, what if you get zeros? So if any of these functions return a zero, that just returns zero, right? That's only one output of a sum over many different values, right? Um, and so you could still say whether that weight caused the value to go up or down, and so you can still have a gradient. And maybe it had no effect, right? If it really is zero for this weight on a particular value, then the gradient will be zero, and you just won't want to change that weight. You say, well, it seems to be fine as it is, right? So an output of zero doesn't break anything. Um, and if we look at the ReLU in particular, this gets mentioned in the lecture, but it's a weird function, right? And it actually seems much more um, effective a lot of times now, um, even though it's zero for the entire lower part, right? So the left side zero and the right side is a linear increasing function. And that's actually by design, right? To say that if, remember what's happening here, right? This is an activation function. So for the entire summary of all the nodes that this is kind of um, being, yeah, being fed into this, it's saying, did um, the value of those weights um, increase or not? And you, you take that number and you, you turn it into some kind of mapping. You scale it by a certain linear increase. So if the increase is large, you're going to get a large increase. If the increase is small, you get a small one. But if the, in if the value of the output function went down, so you increased the value of that weight and then the output function value went down, you got the negative value. Um, you just zeroize it. You say, I don't want to hear about anything that is basically going in the opposite direction. Only tell me about good things. So the way I think of the ReLU function is that it's essentially, I only want to hear about the good stuff. I want to hear about weights that are contributing positively to the model. If they're not contributing and they're actually hurting it, just don't tell me about them. And I'll only focus then, because they'll all be zero, those weights that get a zero won't get updated as much or at all. Um, and the ones that are will. And so you, the weights will keep moving up for the ones that are influencing it. And then if you rescale the weights every once in a while, um, which is another thing people like to do, um, then it won't matter, right? The ones that get zeros will keep going down and down and become irrelevant. So that's me trying to answer that question. But if people have discussion or question on it, I'm happy to talk about it.